Hey Wisecrack, Jared again. Today we're talking about a show that you've all been requesting for a really long time. Our favorite sci-fi nightmare, Black Mirror. Black Mirror tackles a variety of issues posed by technology. And while it may not have a consistent narrative between episodes, we've noticed one theme that keeps coming back. Whether the show is tackling virtual reality, politics, social media, or interspecies erotica, Black Mirror really loves spectacle. If watching Black Mirror gives you a sinking feeling of dread or disgust, it may be because this idea of spectacle isn't science fiction, but is built into the very fabric of our reality. Welcome to this Wisecrack edition on the philosophy of Black Mirror. And of course, spoilers ahead. So what is spectacle? It's not just fireworks, pro wrestling, or your drunk uncle at Thanksgiving. It's really any kind of compelling visual display. TV, video games, the internet, real life, all these things are essentially spectacles. But if there's one kind of spectacle that pervades our daily reality, it's the kind that comes through our screens. If you haven't noticed, Black Mirror is obsessed with screens. The show's promotional art features a cracked screen, and you know, the title is a reference to this. The relationship between screen and viewer is central throughout the show. In the national anthem, an on-screen spectacle mesmerizes a nation, while a performance artist releases a hostage in broad daylight. In nosedive, smartphone screens and uh, eye screens compel everyone to rate their fellow humans just like one might rate a hipster bar on Yelp. In the Waldo moment, a screen literally becomes a politician. Politician. And some of the show's first moments visually emphasize the screens surrounding the British cabinet. We can better understand Black Mirror's screen fixation through the lens of philosopher Guy Debord. In the 1960s, Debord suggested that understanding spectacle was critical to understanding society. In the aptly named Society of the Spectacle, Debord wrote that in the decades following the Industrial Revolution, images and appearances had begun to govern the world. Many of the protagonists in Black Mirror experienced spectacle in their own way. Bing is immersed by screens and 15 million merits, White Bear turns the justice system into a literal spectacle of justice, <laughs> In the national anthem, the merits of pig sex are mostly discussed in terms of public perception. Strong undercurrent of sympathy. Every poll indicates public understanding. Disgust with the captor, outrage at the whole thing, but not at you. However, one of the most illustrative examples is Nosedive, where a young woman named Lacey, like many of us, derives her self-worth from her smartphone. Speaking of which, uh, please don't forget to thumbs up this video. According to Debord, the spectacle is not a series of images, but a social relationship between people that is mediated by images. To oversimplify, we've been numbed by years of advertising and mass culture, and because of that, live shallow, disconnected lives. In Nosedive, what we're going to call Yelp for People has re-engineered society into a new class system based on popularity. I just need some stars, please. Which is in turn based on spectacular social media profiles and fake kindness. Lacey constantly does things she otherwise wouldn't. She takes photos of food she finds disgusting <laughs> and is overly nice to people who play an accessory role in her life. Hope you're having a great night. It's pretty good. All in order to get positive ratings on an app which attributes objective value to people. Nene is putting on a ridiculous show whenever she opens a device. Take a look. Wow. Lacey's co-worker has to be unnaturally kind and beg for positive ratings. They're from the organic stall at the farmer's market? Nobody is free to be their authentic selves because, as Lacey says, That's how the world works. People develop relationships with their phones and apps, which in turn develop relationships with other humans. In other words, to recap the board, our relationships are mediated by images, but in this case, images delivered by our phones. For Debord, the more we recognize our own existence in the terms set forth by the spectacle, the less we understand our own existence and our own desires. What Lacey wants is simple, a fancy new house. We'd need you around a 4.5. 4. 5. For that, she needs to boost her social media score and make good with Nene, her high school friend who had sex with Lacey's boyfriend. In true Debordian fashion, Lacey's increasing immersion in the spectacle makes her a hollow shell of her former self, before finally going cray-cray at Nene's wedding. 
Lacey fails in both being herself and being someone she's not. And I'm so honored to be here to see this I love you, Mayday! The spectacle has not only defined her desire, but made her a prisoner to it. It's only when Lacey is forcefully removed from spectacle and thrown in jail that she seems to find authenticity. You! But how did we get here? How did the society of spectacle take over the lives of Lacey, Bing, Prime Minister Callow, and even our own lives? Debord provides an answer that resonates in Black Mirror. Debord argues that spectacle is born when the economy invades the very fabric of our social lives. In 15 Million Merits, we see what this economic invasion looks like as entertainment dictates every aspect of social life. Bing pointlessly rides a bike to accumulate virtual currency he can only spend on necessities, entertainment, or his… me? He and everybody else lives in a cube made with screens, where he constantly receives pop-up ads he has to ignore. Things that exist outside of this me economy are frowned upon. In one telling scene, paper origami is discarded as garbage, because it doesn't exist in the circuit of labor and commodities offered by what I'm going to call George Orwell's favorite soul cycle class. I love choosing my own clothes, and I love gold. I feel like it really expresses who I really am. In an attempt to escape the spectacle, Bing becomes obsessed with authenticity and decides to do something meaningful for someone else, namely getting a woman he heard singing in the bathroom a shot at becoming famous. You've got something real. You heard me singing in a toilet. Is that real? More than anything has happened all year. But some Simon Cowell wannabe has other plans. You've got this pure beauty. Seems to be a knockout figure and this sort of interesting innocence going on. And that's something I think Wright's erotica channels could really play with. The economic incentive to pimp out Abby outweighs whatever hopes and dreams she or Bing had. Bing even explicitly reflects on the way that the economy has infiltrated their lives. And a fake and a footer is the more you love it because fake footer is the only thing that works anymore. All we know is fake footer and buying shit. That's how we speak to each other, how we express ourselves is buying shit. But as we learn, even dissent becomes a commodity. You're somehow articulating something we all, and I mean everyone in this hall, something we all agree on. Authenticity is in woefully short supply. Bing gets a lavish apartment, everyone remains miserable, and the spectacle goes on, literally. This economic invasion of everyday life, or debord, happens at a very specific moment, when being becomes having when who you are is defined by what you have. This logic is everywhere in our own society. Wearing a dead Kennedy's shirt makes you a rebel. Guzzling Pepsi makes you an activist. And having a bumper sticker makes you whatever kind of pretentious you aspire to be. Black Mirror follows this logic, but takes it a step further. In Be Right Back, a grieving woman purchases a life-size avatar of her boyfriend after he dies. I won't bite. Having a relationship replaces being in a relationship. The shard of glass Bing uses to threaten to kill himself becomes a virtual commodity. Owning rebellion replaces being rebellion. Farewell forever. To the same time next week. The Waldo moment further explores what happens when this logic enters the political sphere. It follows Gwendolyn Harris, an aspiring politician, and Jamie Salter, a comedian who voices a foul-mouthed cartoon bear that becomes a global icon. The Waldo moment focuses on the unreality of politics. Gwendolyn truly wants to be a politician, but struggles with the spectacle of it all. While she seems genuinely concerned with policy, I was at least attempting to represent, well, I don't, I don't know, not just bollocks to everything. Her campaign is just a show for her future aspirations. The way you describe it, it's like you're doing this for a show reel. No. So it's good exposure. You're not gonna win, you know you're not gonna win. Meanwhile, Jamie is a depressed, joke-making nihilist who begrudgingly runs for office. Except, people seem way too into his message. Waldo is pure spectacle. Oh, there's no point in attempting to converse with a, a cartoon. Ooh, converse, your lordship. Thy flowery language doth give me a right throbbing bone on. <laughs> his only metric for success seems to be attention. I've been, uh, I've been arguing for a reduction in the, in the license fee. Good morning, everybody. Why are you ignoring me, Mr. Munro? Why are you ignoring me? Mr. Monroe, Mr. Monroe, why are you ignoring me? And like any spectacle, it's pure image with no substance. Jamie constantly reminds us he's not real. But as it turns out, that doesn't seem to really matter. Waldo's not real. 
exactly. That's what you said that really hit home. He's not real, but he's realer than all the others. Spectacle is bigger than any of its individual actors. An autonomous system, like if Skynet decided to only care about cat videos and reality TV. And for the real politicians like Monroe, who have always succeeded by a spectacle. I think we should have a little round of applause for the children. It's fantastic. They become powerless in the face of a much better spectacle. A career politician. Someone else less real than me, and I can do this. <laughs> Monroe's last minute attempts to appeal to real politics are pointless because the spectacle had won long ago. For DeBoard, the system gives us competing spectacles that are nothing more than vaporous qualities meant to stimulate loyalty to quantitative trivialities. In other words, just as spectacle compels Yankees fans to hate Red Sox fans, it compels people to identify with a blue bear who makes fart jokes. The system can profit as much from the Yankees versus the Red Sox as it can from Waldo versus the status quo. Everyone's pissed with the status quo, and Waldo gives that a voice. Waldo's a bear. As with Bing, dissent is a commodity. You could roll this out worldwide. Like Pringles. Absolutely. Or as DeBoard says, the smug acceptance of what exists can also merge with purely spectacular rebellion. This reflects the simple fact that dissatisfaction itself became a commodity. So here's a question. Are we headed towards our inevitable destruction like Black Mirror imagines? Well, maybe there's hope. The show balances its pessimism with the episode San Junipero in which two dying women fall in love in a simulated reality and choose to live there for eternity instead of accepting death. In this world, the spectacle of San Junipero isn't a nightmare, but literally heaven. DeBoard wrote The Society of the Spectacle in the 60s, so he was mostly talking about a world dominated by television, radio, movies, and mass advertisement. He didn't see or predict the advent of smartphones or social media, but he certainly foresaw how they would shape society in a pretty prophetic way. So what do you think, Wisecrack? Will Spectacle drive us to the hellish world of Black Mirror, or are we already there? Hey guys, thanks for watching. To watch some of my favorite episodes, click here or here to check them out. And be sure to subscribe and ring that bell to get notified of our next videos. There's a lot to talk about in Black Mirror, so if you want to see us do some breakdowns of individual episodes, let us know in the comments. Thanks for watching, Wisecrack. Peace.